Uh, my name is Joe Kadama. I'm a visiting professor of social work at Grand Valley State University. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about, uh, and we're recording this, yeah, Jane? Cool. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, Patrick Leoya in a uh, global historical macro lens. So I'm not going to talk as much about the actual incident, the actual murder, as maybe some people think that I am. But instead, I'm going to try to set a, a background and a context that might help us think about that together. Um, I'm just going to have him play it just for time's sake. OK. Uh, so special thanks to Jane Bruin for inviting me out here uh, and to a variety. Yeah, there we go. And to a variety of Calvin connected people who, uh, whose scholarship and reporting and activism I'm relying on here, Abdul Saleh Havagamana, Michelle Jokushpolo, Jeff Bloom, Willie Jennings, Kurt Verbeek, Joanne Van Engen, Dr. Damaris Parsitao. Uh, I'm not a historian, but I'm leaning on several pretty prominent black historians here, W.E.B. Du Bois, John Hope Franklin, and George Washington Williams. Uh, if those names don't mean anything to you, check them out. I'm going to start with some uh, baseline assumptions. And again, if you don't agree with the baseline assumptions, uh, the rest of the presentation probably isn't going to go so well for, for us. Uh, but one of them is that race is a social construct. This is a Baldwin quote. I'm not going to read all the quotes. There's going to be lots of them. But you can take a look at that. James Baldwin believed quite fervently that this was about justifying an identity and what he says here is a genocidal history. That by persuading themselves that a black child's life meant nothing compared to a white child's life, they defined and debased themselves. So in defining whiteness, uh, Baldwin argues, you have to define blackness. And in defining blackness as less than and as subhuman, uh, white people have, since the inception of whiteness, uh, debased themselves. I mentioned I'm not going to show uh, footage of Patrick Leoya being shot in the back of the head uh, because I would argue that that's uh, a lynching propaganda and that it's in itself dehumanizing and not meant for consumption. So I'm not going to be showing that footage. I'm not going to be analyzing the last seconds or minutes of his life or the decisions that he made. Uh, or the decisions that the officer made. I'm not going to talk about use of force policies or de-escalation um, or any of that. I am going to assume that this was a murder. That's my personal opinion. Uh, but it's also the opinion of the Republican County Prosecutor here in Kent County, Chris Becker, who has charged Christopher Schur with second degree murder. Uh, and he's waiting on his probable cause hearing which has been delayed a couple times now uh, and is next scheduled for October 27. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the police or policing in the United States. Um, I am going to assert, based on previous work that I've done on this stage, uh, that there are good reasons to be suspicious of the Grand Rapids Police Department that the Grand Rapids Police Department has a documented track record of racist policing, racial profiling, and corruption. Uh, that they have been accused of excessive force on multiple occasions. And that the majority of the police officers uh, come from outside our community and only come here uh, to police our community. If any of that is new information for you or you want to look more into that, I've got a whole hour and a half lecture on it that you can check out on YouTube. So I'm going to be assuming, one, that race is a social construct and that part of defining whiteness uh, as it's come to us today is to define blackness as less than, but that that plants a seed of dehumanization in, in white people uh, from the, from the get-go. This is obviously a very painful topic to talk about. I'm going to dive into a lot of church history, a lot of associated other history, uh, there's going to be lots and lots of facts and quotes and maps, but I don't want us to forget that at the center of this is a man who was shot in the back of the head on a rainy morning, April 4, last spring, about three miles down Burton Street. Uh, and that his family came here fleeing violence 
2014, after having lived in a refugee camp since 2003. We will talk more about that. Uh, that's Patrick Leoya's father, Peter Leoya, in, in the forefront. At the center of my own considerations about this is the question of what does justice for Patrick Leoya mean? What do we mean when we say justice for Patrick Leoya? And I'm going to again make another assumption here that when I say justice for Patrick Leoya, I'm not talking first, foremost, or exclusively about criminal justice, right? I certainly hope that that happens. Uh, I think that officer sure deserves to be locked up, former officer. Uh, that does not mean I believe he is less than human or deserves to rot somewhere. I taught in the Calvin Prison Initiative. Uh, I believe that prisoners have inherent dignity and worth and can make great strides, uh, but I also believe in justice. Bracket that, that's criminal justice, right? I don't think the protesters, and I certainly don't think Patrick's family is thinking exclusively about whether that officer goes to prison or not. What they are thinking about and talking about is broader than that. They're talking about social justice or primary justice. Uh, if you're in the Christian crowd, biblical justice, which is not just correcting things, but it is the fundamental way things are supposed to be. Goodness, uh, shalom, human flourishing, etc. Um, those are words that I think get thrown around here a lot. Uh, so I think that's what people mean, right? And that requires considering a lot more than the incident. So when I start talking about colonialism or uh, theories of bi biblical exegesis, I'm doing that because I think for us to consider what justice means uh, for Patrick Leoya, we have to go a lot deeper than the isolated incident. Everybody on board with that? Yes. All right. So let's go back then. Um, people who have been in my presentations before know I have lots and lots of stuff. Um, we're going to go way back. <laughs> um, I wanted to start in 1390. Um, I'll briefly go back a little further than that, and then we're going to zoom up to the present. Uh, I wanted to start in 1390 because I don't think it's appropriate to start talking about any history that has to do with Africa with European colonization, as if nothing was going on uh, on the continent before white people arrived. So the Kingdom of the Congo uh, was one of those uh, pre-colonization empires in what is now Angola and the Democratic Republic of the Congo that was coalesced probably in about 1390 out of existing city-states. It was highly organized and highly centralized around a capital uh, that's now in modern-day Angola, but was then uh, considered the, the seat of the Kingdom of the Congo. Uh, the Kingdom of the Congo lasted uh, as a ind fully independent state, I would say, until about 1660s, uh, when the Portuguese, who had been um, involved <laughs> uh, with their uh, trading, uh, sort of fully took over, and it became a vassal state of Portugal in the 1860s. That gets traced back to something that people have also heard me talk about before, uh, which is the doctrine of discovery. Mark Charles, who comes to Calvin a lot, has talked about this. He's written a book about it, Unsettling Truths, with Sung Shan Ra, that I highly recommend. Check it out. Uh, if you're not familiar with the doctrine of discovery, my unlearned talk last year looked at the implications for the doctrine of discovery right here in Grand Rapids with the Council of the Three Fires and the uh, Ojibwe, Odawa, and uh, Potawatomi peoples. So you can learn lots more about that, too, if you want. Uh, but the Pope. Uh, Pope Nicholas V, um, back in the 1400s, um, there was a war between Portugal and Spain, or Seville, over control of North Africa and uh, the West African coast. And the Pope, uh, not wanting to see two Catholic empires clash, got in the middle of that and said, hey, Portugal, go ahead, you're going to take all of West Africa. Uh, and he did that under the idea that it was to become their property. And that when they discovered it, they would have the freedom to take the people, the kingdoms, <laughs> the goods, everything for their own personal profit. And that this would benefit the papacy and Christianity by allowing them to pursue their ultimate goal, which was the reconquest of Jerusalem, right? So they're in the midst of the Crusades. They're short on money. <laughs> 
Where are we going to get money? We've heard there's lots of gold in North Africa with Mansa Musa and other people. We're going to send explorers down the coast of West Africa. We're going to get some of that gold. We're going to take slaves, and we're going to reconquer Jerusalem. This is actually also Christopher Columbus's ultimate goal, if you read his personal jo uh, journals, was the reconquest of Jerusalem. This is what they thought the world looked like at that point. <laughs> So obviously they had a pretty good idea of Europe, but a very imperfect idea of what was going on along the coast of Africa. This is a map from 1459. Uh, but uh, Henry the Navigator takes these papal, papal bulls and heads on out in his ships down the coast of West Africa. And within uh, you know, 30 years of those papal bulls has made it most of the way down to the Congo or what we know as the Congo today and set up uh, trading posts and stones with the cross on them. Uh, the Portuguese reach the Kingdom of the Congo in the 1480s, and when they reach it, it is a highly centralized, highly developed court. The Mani Congo, the ruler of the Kingdom of the Congo, is a well-respected king. He has vassal states uh, arrayed around him. His capital is up on a bluff over the Congo River, and the Portuguese are quite impressed. The Mani Congo travels to Portugal, he converts to Christianity, and from then on, uh, the Kingdom of the Congo is a Christian empire in Central Africa run by uh, converted uh, Congolese people. Um, they, that was, this is the fifth Mani Congo, who takes uh, the name John in Portuguese, right? His Christian name is John. Uh, his Congolese name was Nzinga Anukuku. Uh, but he, uh, the fifth Mani Congo, he converts to Christianity, uh, and from then on, all the way until the last uh, titular king and queen of the Congo in 1934, um, they are all Christian, right? They produce, in fact, this is from the 1500s, the time of John Calvin, uh, they're producing crucifixes in the kingdom of the Congo depicting Jesus as an African, uh, and they have their own version of Christianity right, which they hold to be uh, true. Uh, it's really uh, quite impressive. And the slavery at this time, as dictated in the papal bulls, was then people who were not Christian, Muslims and pagans, right? ...said, you can search out and enslave people if they are Muslim or if they are pagan. Well, the rulers of the Kingdom of the Congo were Christian, right? So this starts a long partnership between the Kingdom of the Congo and the Portuguese, wherein they take people from the inner regions of the Congo who are not Christian or have been conquered in war and sell them to Portugal. When you talk about slavery uh, in West Michigan, uh, there's always gonna be some white guy who's like, did you know <laughs> that Africans enslaved each other? <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> every, every serious historian knows this. This is not a huge gotcha moment. Um, but what it, what it confuses is, is a racialized slavery with uh, a slavery that's done on religious terms. <laughs> the, the king of the Congo did not consider the people that he was enslaving to be like him, to be his brothers and sisters. They were often, in fact, his enemies, right? Uh, he considered himself to be the Christian brother uh, of the King of Portugal, right? He sent his children to study at Portuguese seminaries. <laughs> they came back and founded churches. This was a reciprocal relationship um, that went back and forth. In fact, uh, King Afonso, uh, one of the kings of the Congo, they all took Portuguese names, uh, sends a letter um, to King Manuel of Portugal at the time in 1514, uh, because Portugal starts uh, going a little soft on these rules. <laughs> Portugal has an insatiable appetite for slaves, but in the Kingdom of the Congo, you weren't supposed to enslave any women. It was only men. Uh, so in this letter from 1514, King Afonso says, hey, your Portuguese traders keep taking women, and I want you to stop that. And he says, and many of your priests are operating their churches as whorehouses, and you should probably stop that too. Um, because he is a Christian monarch, right? Um, for uh, any feminists in the house, uh, 
Under the Kingdom of the Congo rules, one of the, the uh, you know, this is in the scholarship, who knows if it's apocryphal or entirely true, but it was said that in the Kingdom of the Congo, if somebody uh, raped a young woman, uh, he was made her slave. Uh, that that was one of the ways that you could become a slave, uh, in fact, was sexual assault against a woman. Uh, 1526, uh, he complains again. The Portuguese are taking our natives, sons of the land, and sons of our noblemen, and our vassals, and our relatives. <laughs> he says, hold up, again, uh, we were fine sending you these prisoners of war, but now your traitors are coming in here and just taking everybody, uh, and you need to stop. <laughs> we, need, we need to get this back under control. Um, in fact, in 1580, a group of slaves is taken to Sao Tome off the coast of West Africa that included some noble people. And the king of the Congo actually goes to Sao Tome to emancipate them and bring them back. He says, this was a mistake. These are free people. They shouldn't be enslaved, right? Uh, but none of those tribal or ethnic distinctions or political distinctions made any sense to the Portuguese who were slowly becoming to think in racial terms that these are all black people, right? At the linchpin of the relationship between the Kingdom of the Congo and Portugal was a problem of currency exchange. In the Kingdom of the Congo, you may be aware, they used cowrie shells um, or uh, nzumbu shells as the currency. This was the legal tender. Money is a social construct. <laughs> um, and you could buy a lot of things with it. But the Portuguese said, we don't want your shells because we have no interest in shopping in the Congo. So anytime we do trade, give us slaves. Now, uh, we might understand today that they didn't want the shells, right? But <laughs> the Kingdom of the Congo also had ivory, cloth, copper, uh, any number of other things with immense material value that the Portuguese simply were not interested in having. Any time that the Kingdom of the Congo asked the Kingdom of Portugal for anything, they demanded to be paid in slaves. By the late 1600s, uh, they had come to realize that this was a tremendous mistake. Uh, so this is almost uh, 300 years after the founding of the Kingdom of the Congo, and King Garcia II, uh, who was the, the upper part there is from his inauguration ceremony. Again, he was a Christian king, right? Uh, inaugurated to do justice. But the lower part is a letter he sent to Father Felipe Franco, and he says, the trade in money and slaves, which are not gold nor cloth, but creatures, in our simplicity, we gave place to that from which grows all the evils of our country. Because under the rules of the Kingdom of the Congo, you could only enslave other people or people who rebelled and prisoners of war. And so increasingly, rival factions within the Kingdom of the Congo and the Counts of Soyo, which was a, a heavily uh, quasi-independent part of the Kingdom of the Congo, engaged in military conflict in order to take slaves. The result of this, this is from a 2020 genetic survey, um, is that the vast majority of people who were involved in the transatlantic slave trade came from the Congo Basin. The United States, in terms of the amount of slaves who came to the United States, actually ranks quite low, uh, although uh, we could talk about the numbers that came via the Caribbean and the sugar colonies in the Caribbean. But the, the bulk of the transatlantic slave trade was Portuguese, and it occurred between the Congo and Brazil. Uh, so as we watch the unfolding election in Brazil with Jair Bolsonaro, uh, who is very much a European white man, uh, remember that there are the vast majority of people who participate in the transatlantic slave trade, those Africans are Afro-Brazilians today. All right. Now we're gonna go into uh, how we did this, how we defined this. And this is all about moving from we can enslave non-Christians to we're gonna enslave black people. And Christians needed a legitimate reason to do that. And you see this develop over a period of a couple hundred years where they say, okay, what's really going on here <laughs> is that these are the, ch the children of Ham right? The curse of Ham. If this uh, whole section seems a little out of place to you, uh, David Goldenberg argues that this was the central driver of slavery for a thousand years uh, in the colonial West. And it all comes from Genesis 9, right? 
uh, where this very odd story uh, in the Bible, after uh, the rainbow comes out, Noah gets wasted, uh, is naked in his tent, and his son sees him. Uh, some people say his son has sex with him. The text is ambiguous. We don't know. <laughs> people argue about it a lot. Uh, either way, he shames his father, Ham does, and then Noah, for reasons again we don't really understand, curses not Ham, but actually Ham's son, Canaan. And a lot of uh, social critis critics of uh, biblical reading would say this was an origin myth that helped the Jewish people legitimize their war against the Canaanites, right? So you need a religious story to back up what you're doing in Joshua and Judges. So you go back to this and you say, well, look, God cursed uh, Canaan from the get-go. Uh, but you do find, let Canaan be his slave, right? Uh, the three sons of Noah, Ham, uh, Japheth, and Shem. This actually goes back even further. This is from AD 600, uh, St. Isidore. This is a saint, Catholic bishop. Um, this is a map of the world. <laughs> At the time, 8600, it was very undefined. Uh, but you can see, uh, and it's a symbolic map, but you can see already in 8600, he's divided the world into Ham, Japheth, and Shem, right? And he says, Europe is Japheth, Africa is Ham, Asia is Shem. This fell apart a little bit when they discovered the new world, uh, but they made it work as these theories tend to go. Um, this stuck around for a long time. <laughs> and in fact, I'm gonna argue that it's very much still how a lot of fundamentalist Christians think today. Uh, because if you are a literalist and you're an extreme biblical literalist, you do believe that all people are descended from Noah and his sons. So you really have no choice. Um, you have to believe somehow that everyone is descended from those three individuals. <laughs> all right, I'll come back to that. Uh, people loved this theory across the American South, <laughs> loved it. Uh, it was the primary theological justification for race-based chattel slavery in the United States. Um, so you can see here the relations to society, to government, true religion, uh, concerned in the light of biblical teachings, right? Origin, nature, slavery. Um, DuBose Review, which was a scholarly journal out of the South, um, wrote about this quite a lot. Um, the unity of the human race disproved by the Hebrew Bible, right? Um, here's, here's a quote from that article. Some of these quotes are going to be quite disturbing, right? Um, but here, the article of this, this journal article in the South, he was a medical doctor, by the way. Um, the same person who coined the fake mental illness drapedomania which was the supposed mental illness of wanting to run away as a slave. <laughs> uh, because uh, it was imagined that slaves would never want to run away if they were psychologically healthy. So if they were running away, they had drapedomania. Same guy who came up with that pinned this all back to Canaan, right? The curse of Canaan, the curse of Ham. Uh, I said this is still very much current today. Anybody know who that is? John MacArthur. I can rely on Dr. Washington. <laughs> Here's a sermon he gave in 2001, right? Um, the Canaanites are doomed to perpetual slavery, so Ham settles to the South, Africa, and then he lumps Asia in there. The, again, this gets all weird sometimes. He says only, only Europeans are from Japheth, and Shem is the Israelites, right? Uh, everybody else is Ham <laughs> uh, with John MacArthur, which shouldn't necessarily surprise you because John MacArthur went to Bob Jones University. And Bob Jones University um, wouldn't allow black students for many years under their religious freedom. They said, we have sincerely held Christian beliefs that black people and white people should not mingle. And the government cannot compel us to make them. They argued that case all the way to the Supreme Court. Anyone know what year it was decided? Further back right around when I was born, 1983. Um, 1983, the government said, hey, if you're gonna keep preventing um, black people from being on your campus, we're gonna take away your tax exempt status. And Bob Jones said, fine, take it. <laughs> and they didn't ban, uh, they didn't lift their ban on interracial dating until the year 2000. 
Uh, there's uh, Kristen Dume. I think she still teaches around here. <laughs> hey, John MacArthur. Uh, anyway, same thing with this guy. Uh, anybody know who this is? Ken Ham. Uh, he built a massive ARC amusement park in Kentucky. Uh, it's in the background there. Ken Ham and his whole outfit, Answers in Genesis, still explicitly argues that they can prove genetically that all people are descended from Japheth, Shem, and Ham, right? Uh, and that Ham, obviously, is all uh, Chinese, Egypt, Libya, West Africa, blah, 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 blah. Japheth, uh, whoo, starting right off with the Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> In fact, if you go to the Ark Encounter, which I don't necessarily recommend, um, they have his sons there, and they also created their wives just for kicks. Even though there's no mention of their wives' names, they invented personalities. Take a look at the personalities here. <laughs> um, Japheth excelled in farming, adventurous, looks for the future. His wife does arts and crafts in her spare time. Um, Ham, uh, Ham is ambitious. <laughs> His wife, Kezia, uh, is more interested than in the other women in dressing and looking her best. No fun hobbies for Kezia. She just wants to look her best. <laughs> All right. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, coming back to Du Bois. Um, this is, this is, uh, from, I think, 1920. Um, he says, the assumption that all the hues of God, whiteness alone, is inherently and obviously better than brownness or tan leads to the curious acts, even the sweeter souls of the dominant world, as they discourse with me on whether weal and woe are continually playing above their actual words in an obligato of tune and tone, saying, my poor, unwhite thing, weep nor rage, I know too well that the curse of God lies heavy on you. Why? That's not for me to say. But be brave, do your work in your lowly sphere, praying the good Lord that in heaven above, where all is love, you may one day be born white. James Baldwin, similar. I realized that the Bible had been written by white men. I knew, according to many Christians, I was a descendant of Ham, who had been cursed and that I was therefore predestined to be a slave. This had nothing to do with anything I was or contained or could become. My fate had been sealed for from the beginning of time, and it seemed indeed when one looked out over Christendom that this was what Christendom officially believed. So the curse of Ham. Now, the curse of Ham goes through an interesting evolution right around 1800 and becomes something different that relates directly to what we're going to talk about in the Congo. So uh, it becomes not the curse of Ham, but a sociological and anthropological theory called the Hamitic Hypothesis. This is an entirely different thing, although they both mention Ham, and they use the same story to come to similar racist conclusions through very different means. Um, so. The origins of this is with uh, Blumenbach. Uh, in 1776, an, a, a date that should be familiar to Americans, <laughs> uh, our nation was coming of age during a particular moment of thinking about racial classification. But in 1776, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who is collecting skulls, which is a creepy thing to do now and forever, um, <laughs> He has 250 skulls, and here's the, the literal quote. There was one he found particularly enchanting, quote, my beautiful typical head of a young Georgian female, always of itself attracts every eye. So if you've ever wondered where the term Caucasian comes from, it's Blumenbach, right? Because Georgia is in Russia. <laughs> But he liked that woman's skull so much that he decided all white people came from where she came from. And that was science and still is for many people, right? No basis for that. Complete junk. But uh, Blumenbach starts a conversation that becomes known among the founding fathers, for example, as the debate between polygenicism and monogenicism. That is to say, are we actually one human race, or are, are these different races? 
The curse of Ham was a monogenesist thinking. We're all one race, but these black people are the children of Ham, so they're bad. The Hamitic hypothesis is a polygenesist theory that says, we're not so sure these are the same races anymore. And now we have some explaining to do. <laughs> the explaining came from uh, facts that people saw on the ground. This is a depiction of 1798, right? So a few years after uh, the Constitution is signed. Napoleon invades Egypt, and the Western world, for the first time, gets a, a pretty good look through engravings and other things at the pyramids and the Sphinx and the magister, magistry of uh, Egypt. And very quickly, Europe decides black people could never have done this, right? Uh, they conclude the same thing when they encounter Great Zimbabwe in, in southern Africa. They come across the ruins of these great cities and they say, these must have been the work of white people. So where did the white people come from and where did they go? Right? Because the people we see here are not white people right now. So, uh, the Hamitic hypothesis. At this time, they remember, <laughs> conveniently, that the curse isn't actually on Ham, it's on Canaan and that Ham's son Mizraim is the progenitor of Egypt. And so they say, actually, Canaan, that's the black folks. Ham, Egypt, these were white folks, right? Um, and so the Hamitic hypothesis then becomes that there are white descended people in Africa and that anything good in Africa comes from these white descended Hamitic people. Following? All right, the argument then was what happened to them? <laughs> Why do they, you know, what happened to other folks? And again, the founding fathers love to weigh in on this. If you read Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson, uh, he has his own theories. Uh, he doesn't definitively say whether he believes in a monogenesis or a polygenesis accounting, but he says, you know, whether they were originally a different race or not, it's clearer or whether it was caused by circumstances. There was really bad, again, science out there that say, said being black was just a result of, um, well, actually it turned out to be quite right, that melatonin is related, but just being in, in a hot climate, right? Um, the, the weirdness of the theory was that they believed if you brought black people to America, they would rapidly become white. <laughs> uh, that didn't happen. Um, Although some people um, did circulate, they brought around people who had, what did Michael, vitiligo, um, splotchy skin. Uh, they actually exhibited them at zoos as evidence that black people were becoming white under the climate of North America. All right, so you got the, the Hamitic hypothesis. Um, this is from a book called The Races of Africa by Seligman. Uh, that was published in 1930. <laughs> uh, so this is not that old. It was republished up until 1966. Uh, it was actually revised up until 1966. The last printing of it was in 1979. Uh, this was written by a professor at the London School of Economics. This is not a fringe academic. This was the central anthropology text about Africa for decades. And he believed in the Hamitic hypothesis, right? He said, you have Hamitic people in East Africa, and they're running right up against Bantu people and um, Pygmies and Twa people. And this, this right here, is the seeds of the Rwandan genocide and the continuing destabilization in the Congo. So I'm going to try to sketch that out, that the idea of the Hamitic hypothesis is really at the root of the crisis that drove Patrick Leoya to Grand Rapids. Uh, it was a Christian idea that set that chain in motion. So you get people like Gustav Adolf von Goetzen, who was uh, the German ruler uh, in the Congo slash Burundi, Rwanda. That whole region is obviously changing in borders all the time. It was German before World War I. In World War I, German lo Germany lost all their colonies, right? So they had, uh, you know, by World War II, certainly, they had Namibia, they had Togo, they had German East Africa, uh, but they lost that all in the war. But he says there, right, Tutsis are Hamitic pastoralists from Ethiopia. 
um, who have subjugated uh, the local Bantu population, who are the Hutu population. Uh, a Belgian vicar, the Batutsi are superb with fine and regular features, something of the Aryan and the Semite. Belgian territorial governor, the Batutsi were designed to reign over the inferior races that surround them. So you have all these colonial officials coming in and saying the Tutsi are not uh, just a pastoral class, which is how most people would associate them today. This, this was actually a distinction between how you made your living as pastoralists or herds people versus agriculturalists, and a class distinction, right? That wealthier people were pastoralists and uh, people with less wealth were farmers. But there's, there's ample evidence that people could move from being Tutsi to Hutu and Hutu to Tutsi um, by achieving wealth or poverty, right? That all gets cemented in the colonial period into a racialized hierarchy that says these are actually white people uh, or the closest thing to white people in the area and we're gonna work with them and we're gonna subjugate the Hutu. It's all based on phrenology and craniology and measuring noses and all the same uh, eugenic fake racial social, uh, social science of the day. Uh, but they really believe that they can determine uh, by measuring people's brains and faces of uh, their race, right? Which again is a lie. Uh, they issue ID cards and they make this formal, right? Uh, this person is Tutsi. <laughs> Um, it doesn't matter what they look like, now I'm telling you what they are. Uh, and these ID cards were actually uh, death sentences for people during the genocide uh, when it was you know, used to determine whether or not they were going to be killed. All the way up to the genocide itself, and then I'm going to loop back, you see people talking about Hamites, right? This is on Rwandan radio. This is translated from Key Rwandan by a Rwandan scholar, right? The Tutsi are nomads and invaders who came to Rwanda in search of pasture. If you allow the Tutsi Hamites to come back, they will not only rule you in Rwanda, but throughout the Great Lakes region. So the Hutu radio stations are saying, get these Hamite pastoralist invaders out of our country. They base that on the same sort of ideas about noses and physiology that they got from the colonial leaders. This is a, a well-known uh, hate speech radio host, right? The proof that we will exterminate them is they represent only one ethnic group. Look at his height, look at his uh, physical features, look closely at his cute little nose and then break it. Uh, and they did, right? They killed a million people in 100 days. Let's talk then about the Congo. Uh, I'm doing pretty well on time. Uh, I'm going to rely heavily through this section on a book called King Leopold's Ghost. Anybody read that one? A few people. Um, and then I'll head to some other sections. But this out outlines the Congo Free State, um, which was owned by a single man, King Leopold of Belgium. King Leopold of Belgium was the uncle of Queen Victoria, who is uh, Queen Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother. <laughs> Uh, the royal families of Europe are notoriously intertwined. Uh, Leopold wanted a colony for Belgium. More importantly, he wanted a colony for himself. <laughs> so he hired a guy named Henry Morton Stanley uh, to go and look at it and see what he could find, right? Uh, this is the Dr. Livingstone, I presume, uh, person. Henry Morton Stanley. Uh, actually was from the United States. His real name uh, is John Rowlands. He wasn't from the United States. He came from Wales. <laughs> but he immigrates to the United States. He claims he's American. Uh, he's sort of a grifter and a con artist, an extremely violent man, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, Stanley is hired by King Leopold to try to map the Congo River because King Leopold means to claim the entire Congo River basin, the entire watershed of the River Congo which is an enormous river, right? It's the deepest river in the world, second largest by volume, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he wants the whole watershed, so he needs to map it. So he hand, uh, sends Stanley in there, um, very clearly indicating that this is not about actually establishing colonies. There's no question from Leopold about granting political power to black people. That would be ridiculous. 
Uh, and in fact, he gets quite angry that Stanley isn't doing this fast enough in terms of negotiating treaties. Uh, we're going to put treaties in air quotes there because they're the same thing that the United States did in uh, here with Native people. Uh, you negotiate the treaty with guns and booze, um, and you take everything, and you give yourself legal reason to do so. Now, the, the connection to the Hamitic hypothesis is actually that Stanley claimed that in, um, let's see, what was the date? In 1876, he claimed that in 1876 he had encountered a tribe of white people in the Great Lakes region of Africa. Uh, he fed this narrative. He said, that's true, they're in there. Uh, give me money, I'll go back and find them again. He said he had seen them around uh, Lake Victoria. <laughs> now, um, Leopold then got together to try to legitimize his claim. The United States was the first country to say, we recognize your claim to the Congo, even before the Belgian, uh, the Conference of Berlin. So Stanley explored it. Leopold said, I'm going to take it. The United States said, go for it. We'll recognize that. Uh, at the Berlin Conference with Otto von Bismarck in Berlin, uh, they carve up Africa. Uh, they were already claiming lots of this, but it was just sort of say, all right, let's play nice and we're going to create some boundaries and stay out of each other's way. Uh, so they get together. The United States is there, even though we don't take colonies officially. Um, I think Dr. Washington and I would both argue that Liberia ought to be considered a, a U.S. colony in some ways. So um, they carve it all up. And uh, King Leopold takes the entire Congo for himself. And they give it to him because he promises to be anti-slavery. <laughs> he is the good guy, King Leopold. In fact, um, Leopold uh, is feted by Christians, missionaries. Everyone is on board with Leopold because Leopold says he's going to stamp out the Arab slave trade. He says the real slave trade, the one we should be talking about, is not the transatlantic slave trade or what happened here. It's the Arabs taking slaves to Saudi Arabia and India. They're the real problem. You give me the Belgium Congo, and I will take care of it, right? And everyone's like, look at this guy. He's going to save the Congo from this menace of Arab slave traders. Now, that doesn't happen, right? Um, the Belgians come in uh, as very, very heavy colonial powers and do terrible things, um, mostly in the search for rubber. Um, at this time, so this is like the 1890s, we're coming into industrialization. The first factories, uh, the first cars, <laughs> everything needs rubber. <laughs> and at this time, you can't make rubber. You have to get rubber from the wild. And at this time, there are also not a lot of rubber plantations. But Stanley sends lots of letters back to Leopold saying, all across the Congo River Basin are vines with rubber dripping out of them everywhere. Uh, and this becomes the main thing. Not the only thing. Leopold also takes out thousands of tons of ivory, which means he killed tens of thousands of elephants, right? Uh, he takes, you know, um, slaves. <laughs> uh, he takes rubber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this gets exceptionally brutal, as we'll talk about in just a second. But that's how the colonial map uh, pans out. Uh, this is pre-World War I. You've got German East Africa, you've got the Belgian Congo, and you have all of French West Africa. Um, my own experiences in Africa, I always say, have been limited by colonialism. <laughs> because I've done work in Nigeria, Liberia, and Ghana. <laughs> Those are the three Anglophone countries uh, surrounded by a sea of French speakers, right? That's all colonization. It continues to shape everything about our world today. Um, Calvin gets students from Nigeria and Ghana. We get way fewer students from Cote d'Ivoire or Burkina Faso or Benin <laughs> or, you know, any of those other countries. Why is that? That's all colonialism, right? So Leopold, um, the bottom there is in Dutch. We're going to talk about Dutch people in a second. Um, spoiler alert, that's from Synod. 
and it says, in the Belgian Congo, there's three times as much freedom as in British Nigeria. It's a hot take. All right. In 1897, in order to justify what he's doing in the Congo, because uh, King Leopold was a PR machine, right? He hid everything. It was all off the books. <laughs> um, you can read more about how he was caught by an, basically an accountant in King Leopold's ghost who was like, wait a minute, these numbers don't add up. Um, so spreadsheets. But in 1897, he brought 267 Congolese people to Belgium. <laughs> So if that looks like a Congolese village, look closely at the trees in the background. Those are Belgian trees. And he brought these people there to exhibit them to his citizens in Belgium to show what a, a benevolent leader he was, right? Meanwhile, disturbing photos coming up, in the actual Congo, um, he was chopping people's hands off. So you may hear stories today about African warlords cutting off people's hands and arms. Um, much like scalping, this was something that was originally done by the colonizers and not by the colonized, right? Uh, Leopold did this first. He cut off people's hands if they would not gather enough rubber or if they put stones in their rubber because they had to meet a weight limit. And as that weight limit kept going up and they kept having to go further and further into the jungle, because again, they were harvesting this from wild vines, not from farms, um, people weren't able to do it and Leopold didn't care, right? The estimates, the modern estimates, are that between the people he directly killed and the public health disaster that spread around it, between eight and 10 million people died under King Leopold in the Congo. Eight to 10 million people, right? This is genocide at an unimaginable level. And this is coming a few decades after five and a half million people were taken out of the Belgian Congo as slaves, right? Right after each other. Enormous, completely destabilizing um, events. This is probably the most famous photo. This is a man named Nsala. Uh, again, uh, we know his name because we know who took this photo and we know, we know, uh, you know everything about it. This photo was taken by Alice um, Harris, Alice Seely Harris, who was a missionary in the Congo. And Sala came to her mission post with a, a package containing the hand and the foot of his five-year-old daughter who had been hacked to death by the force publique, um, King Leopold's militia, because they didn't get enough rubber, right? Alice Seeley, complicated. I'm not gonna call her a hero because she was the epitome of a, of a colonial missionary. <laughs> Here she is sitting at the top of a pile of African kids um, in a pose that remains popular on Instagram um, today. So Alice Seeley took these photos and sends them around and says, hey, um, this guy is a liar. This guy is a liar and a murderer and a genocidal maniac, and somebody needs to stop him. But she had gone there completely trusting him as a missionary, believing that he was stopping slavery. In fact, he held anti-slavery conferences <laughs> in Brussels, where he brought world leaders together to talk about how they were gonna stamp out slavery. One of the people who attended that, and here I think only Dr. Washington's gonna know who I'm talking about, uh, was a guy named George Washington Williams. George Washington Williams, one of the few heroes in this story, uh, which gets pretty dark, uh, was uh, an American uh, free black person who uh, fought in the Civil War for the Union. He enlisted using fake papers at the age of 14. Uh, fought against the Confederates, won the war, fought in Mexico, fought in the Comanche Wars, uh, and then decided that he was done killing people. Uh, he, in fact, said, as a Christian, killing people in a time of peace as a profession was not the noblest life a man could live. So he goes back to seminary. He gives up on being a soldier, uh, and he becomes a historian. He's actually elected to the Ohio House of Representatives 
something that is difficult to believe in 2022. <laughs> um, as a Republican. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he writes uh, the first definitive history of black people in America. And he starts it, the literal first chapter is about what? Canaan, curse of Canaan. He says, it's a lie, it's a lie. Uh, this isn't true. But, um, oh, here, here's a quote from it. The defenders of slavery and the traducers of the black person built their pro-slavery arguments upon biblical ethnology and the curse of Canaan. I am alive to the fact that while I am a believer in the Holy Bible, it is not the best authority on ethnology. <laughs> uh, that's 1890. <laughs> John MacArthur still thinks it's the best authority on ethnology in 2022. Uh, so George Washington Williams had it right. <laughs> uh, he also had it right about Leopold. He visits and he says, no, 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 no. Um, he attended that slavery conference and Leopold actually tried to stop him from going to the Congo. <laughs> He's like, I can't let this guy get in the Congo because he's going to see what happened. <laughs> he, he tried to prevent him from going for five years. He said, you can go in five years. And then he said, you can't go. He went anyway. He booked his own passage. Uh, and then he writes a very famous open letter that you can read online. It's on uh, blackpast.org, I think, the whole thing. An open letter. It's quite long where he just lays into every single evil thing he sees in the Congo. <laughs> Uh, and at the conclusion, he says, all these crimes have been done in your name. Uh, what are you going to do about it? Unfortunately, right after he writes this, he returns to England and he dies uh, in Blackpool. He gets sick, dies. Um, so he never gets to follow up on this, right? But uh, he was one of the few people who was like, no, Leopold is a liar. Uh, Henry Morton Stanley called this letter a deliberate attempt at blackmail and said it was all lies, right? He knew better. He had killed people himself in the Congo. All right. Finally, um, it does get out. Leopold can't keep it up anymore, and he has to give it up, and it becomes a protectorate of Belgium. Again, before this, it had been his, his possession. He owned it himself. Uh, he took billions of dollars adjusted for inflation out of that and spent it on mistresses and castles and fancy gardens and, uh, you know, palaces. You can tour around Belgium and see what the, the stolen wealth of the Congo built. Uh, and I do encourage you when you're in Europe to ask yourself, where did the wealth come from that built what I'm looking at? <laughs> in the same way that when we're in Egypt, if you identify as a Christian, you look at the pyramids and say, that's impressive, but that was built on the slavery of Israelites. It's the same thing, <laughs> right? All right. So uh, he says, I'm never going to say what happened there. He burns all his documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but Belgium continues its same uh, attitude towards its colonies, exhibiting Congolese people in effectively zoos as late as 1958. All right. Today, as part of the global Black Lives Matter movement, in the same way that we're toppling Confederate monuments in the United States, uh, the Belgians are finally beginning to try to topple some of the monuments to King Leopold. All right, I got about a half hour left. I'm going to see what I can get to. <laughs> in the United States, we were all on board with this uh, because we believed we were the children of God, right? That's a theory called supersessionism. <laughs> Uh, and all the Founding Fathers were big on it. In fact, Thomas Jefferson proposed that the seal of the United States be the children of Israel in the wilderness, guided by the pillar of fire. And on the back side, he wanted to put Anglo-Saxon tribal leaders, because that was our, our, our heritage, and that's where we got our form of government from. Ben Franklin wanted to put uh, Pharaoh in the Red Sea and say rebellion against King George was rebellion against uh, uh, tyrants and God. 1900, we're taking colonies. Senators are saying we're the best thing on the world. Uh, we're God's chosen people to make the world better. If you haven't uh, ever looked into America's imperial period when we did take colonies, uh, or if you happen not to be from the Philippines or Puerto Rico or Guam or American Samoa or the US Virgin Islands or, or any of these other places, you may not be as familiar with this period in American history. Cuba, Haiti, 
Uh, these were all American colonial possessions. You can see Uncle Sam here lecturing Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Mauritius, I think. Um, and we did the same things as the Congo. This is the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 in St. Louis. We exhibited Filipino people as an attraction. Uh, we gave them dogs as their only food because people like to watch them eat dogs. Another person who was at the St. Louis World's Fair was Oda Banga, who came from the Congo, <laughs> was exhibited at the St. Louis World's Fair, and then lived at the Bronx Zoo. They posed Oda Banga with monkeys. Um, he was a survivor of pygmy genocide in the Congo by Leopold's Force Publique. His wife and his two children were killed. He was taken and made into an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo. African-American pastors and leaders at the time very much knew that this was wrong. <laughs> Nobody else did. Uh, even what you think of as a, a liberal bastion, the New York Times said, as for Banga himself, he's probably enjoying himself. It's absurd to imagine that he's being humiliated or degraded. It's fine. After World War I, it became clear that Oda Banga could not go back to the Congo. Um, he became deeply depressed. Uh, and on March 20, 1916, uh, at about the age of 32, he built a ceremonial fire and chipped off caps that had been put on his filed down teeth and shot himself in the heart. So he at least died with his teeth. Now, America at this time was deeply racist. The president was racist. <laughs> the president showed films glorifying the Klan in the White House. He was in the film, <laughs> right? Um, Madison Grant, the person who was the head of the Bronx Zoo, <laughs> where Otabanga was, um, had written deeply racist books. The Passing of the Great Race. The Great Race was the white race. Um, Charles Scrivener and Sons, 1916, argued that the only real white people were actually Nordic people. <laughs> so now we were getting into sub-differences of white people. Not everyone was white enough, right? Uh, this was loved. He was best friends with uh, Teddy Roosevelt, fellow conservationist. Teddy Roosevelt uh, called the book uh, amazing, a capital book. Uh, and he says, you know, Madison Grant is out here saying the things that we all know, but um, Lothrop Stoddard, the threat against world white supremacy, the rising tide of color. Uh, this is a bestseller in the United States. He debates W.E.B. Du Bois <laughs> on whether uh, the Negro has the same intellectual possibilities as other races and gets whooped on. <laughs> Um, but he was also loved, right? Warren G. Harding, president after uh, Wilson, right? Says, hey, Lothrop Stoddard's book, The Rising Tide of white, Worldwide White Supremacy, is a great book, <laughs> right? Um, it helps us learn that our race problem in the United States is part of a global race problem. He gave this speech in Birmingham, <laughs> Uh, we got to stop talking about equality, recognizing that there are fundamental, eternal, and inescapable differences between black and white people. All right, what's going on in Grand Rapids at this time? Uh, everyone who's <laughs> had lectures with me has seen this before, but that's the Klan marching down Bridge Street on July 4, Independence Day, 1925. Now, <laughs> If that all sounds real Nazi-ish, it's because it is. Um, Alfred Rosenberg, who wrote the Nuremberg Race Laws, cited Madison Grant's book in that legal code. Adolf Hitler called Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race his Bible. He said it was the most important book he owned. He quoted from it in many of his speeches. 
Lothrop Stoddard went on, no surprises here, to write pretty nice books about the Nazis. The Nazis had practiced genocide in Africa, in Namibia. Um, before they killed six million Jews, they killed 75,000 Hararo tribesmen in Namibia in concentration camps at places like Shark Island. They experimented on them racially. Uh, they sent heads back to Germany to study at labs to prove racial superiority. They argued, in fact, that Jewish people were an amalgamation of Orientals, black people, and Hamites. So, uh, Nazi ideology was American ideology at the time. Um, the Nazi anthropologist Eugene Fisher uh, worked at Shark Island concentration camp and then later uh, conducted research at Auschwitz. Race scientist, right? He's reading the Journal of Heredity. Okay. Let's talk about the CRC. Uh, Abraham Kuyper. Uh, Abraham Kuyper believed that uh, black people were inferior to white people. So you, you hear a lot of the every square inch quote. Uh, you hear less that the Hottentots and the Bantus were an inferior race and that to put them on footing of equality with the whites and their families in society and in politics would be simply folly. This is him writing about the Dutch war colony in South Africa. He praises the Boer colony for saying that to have sexual intercourse with a black woman is to commit incest. So he was, he was deeply opposed to miscegenation, which again was illegal in the United States until 1967 with Loving. Uh, he, his doctrine of election, predestination, which you hear a lot about, he says in his Stone lectures, which he delivered at Princeton, that this applied to both um, salvation and to uh, the realm of nature. That God elects who to save and that God elects who to be black and who to be white. And obviously it's great if God elects to save you and if God elects for you to be white. You would rather be, if you're an insect, he says, you'd rather be a butterfly than a spider. If you're a human, you would rather be Aryan than a Hottentot. Anyone in Veenstra? <laughs> All right. I gotta, you know, this is, I'm, I'm not trying to be light about it, but it's extremely heavy. Um, Johanna Veenstra was actually great. So if you're like, I'm in Veenstra, I'm not gonna admit it right now because it seems like a dangerous moment. <laughs> um, Johanna Veenstra went as a missionary to Nigeria and then said, hey, CRC, will you back me up on that? Right? And they commissioned a study. This is new, by the way. I don't know of anyone who's ever talked about this material. Uh, this is from the Acts and Agenda of Synod 1920, um, at least the, the agenda part. I know my friend John Maidendorp wrote about the Acts part. And uh, Synod 1920 says, should we go to China or should we go to Sudan, which at that time is all of upper Africa, right? Um, okay. So they're like, all right, ba, 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 ba. I assume you all can't read Dutch, so I translated that. <laughs> the black inhabitants of the Sudan are called the children's races of the world. Like children, they can easily be brought under the influence of other higher nations. A nation in this low state of development seems to be susceptible to the gospel. Let the children come to me. Seems to apply to the infant nations as well. Mission history clearly shows how God gracefully manifests, manifests, that's a translation error, sorry, itself among the children's nations of the world. Though perhaps the black race will never occupy such an eminent place among the population of the world as whites, yet under skilled labor, it may be expected that Africa too will produce such men as Booker T. Washington and Samuel Crowther. I knew you'd like that. <laughs> um, so here they're saying, look, you know, it's not great, but it'll be easy to teach them because they're kids. And maybe if we go there, they could be like Booker T. Washington. They go on to describe the Sudan. The word Sudan, the name of this part of Africa to which the Synod of Christian Reformed Church of 19 has sent your committee, signifies the land of darkness. 
It is the land of blacks. It is largely unknown land, a land of children's races, the living in deep ignorance, superstition, tribulation, war, slavery, verily darkness. The Sudan heads all the way down to the Congo in the south, further south, regions inhabited by dwarf and cannibal tribes. The agenda, so this is like the agenda for Synod. They say, okay, we've studied the regions. We think we ought to go to China, or to Africa, right? I already gave away the, the spoiler here. Um, they actually write 49 pages about Sudan and 18 pages about China. And the authors of the report are very clearly in favor of the CRC going to the Sudan for a number of reasons. Uh, chief among them was the threat of Islam and that there was natural industry in Central Africa, which we'll talk about. But Synod says no. And it says in its decision, the Acts of Synod, 1920, the inhabitants of the Sudan belong to the type of people from whom little can be expected for the kingdom of God. We're not going to go there. Somebody puts a motion on the floor that says, can we at least say we're going to go to China first and then the Sudan? Motion defeated. All right. The Congo. I'm going to try to wrap up, but we'll see where I can get to. The Congo is rich in minerals, and that's the source of many of its problems. All right. Uh, one of the little known facts about that that you may, well, who knows? Anyone know that we got the material for the atom bomb in, in the Congo? Negotiated that from the Belgian colonial masters and used it to develop the bombs that we exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, incinerating people to show the world that we could incinerate people. They chose Hiroshima, they've admitted this, because they wanted to demonstrate that they could blow up an entire city with one bomb. They chose it because of its size relative to the bomb. Now, um, people have been calling out the United States for stuff like this for a long time. When the UN came on the scene, for example, uh, African Americans put together a report, 1951, that said, hey, the United States is committing genocide in the United States. <laughs> That's Paul Robeson. Uh, W.E. Du Bois was also an author on this report. The problem was that they were communists, and so we didn't care. Uh, and we actually just seized their passports, and they were not allowed to travel either inside or outside the United States again. But uh, some of the passages in that We Charge Genocide report, which was about lynching in America, are, are haunting, right? Here's one that haunts me the most in the, in the light of the Congo and its minerals and how they were used to incinerate people. White supremacy at home makes co for colored massacres abroad. Both reveal contempt for human life in a colored skin. The lyncher and the atom bomber are related. Now, this became a real problem for the United States in the Cold War. These are Russian and Chinese propaganda posters. <laughs> sent to Africa that say, hey, the United States hates people that look like you. We love you. We are uh, atheists, and we don't care what color your skin is. Come be communists. In the background of this one, you can see Africa must live. Uh, we mourn for Lumumba, who we're going to talk about in a second. Dean Acheson, who was Secretary of State for Henry Truman, said, you know, I think it's quite obvious that the existence of discrimination against minority groups in the United States is a handicap in our relations with other countries. John F. Kennedy, when he was meeting with African dignitaries post-independence, was frequently told horror stories. This was an ambassador from Chad who had been refused a bedroom at a hotel between New York and Washington. <laughs> Here he is, he's the ambassador from this nation. He's flown here to meet with the president. He lands in New York. He drives down Route 40 to Washington, D.C. He tries to stay at a motel, and they say no because he's black. That's embarrassing for the U.S. government. And when the interests of the U.S. government align with the interests of black people, uh, change happens. The civil rights movement was partially driven by the global context of the Cold War and the fact that the United States needed to stop looking like it was overtly racist or it was never going to win independent African nations' trust, right? And you just learned some critical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> That's called interest convergence theory, and it's from Derek Bell at Harvard, so check it out. <laughs> but 
As late as 1987, back at Calvin, people were still arguing that apartheid was not a heresy. <laughs> uh, this is a professor from the religion department, Henry Vandergoot, who's still alive and is a donor to the seminary. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he says, the fundamental ontological principle with which this philosophy of history and the state works is the idea of differentiation of creation. On the basis of history and scripture, I believe that separate development is a fundamentally Christian idea. I believe it to be false that the idea of the transcendent and spiritual unity of the body of Christ requires the institutional and structural idea of an integrated society. Right? So if you read Plantinga and you hear about differentiation uh, in, in how Reformed theology has worked, think about this too. All right? He also went on to argue that if we played into the anti-apartheid movement, the Marxists would win in Africa <laughs> and that the CRC was being dumb. Now, other Calvin professors argued the opposite. Nick Walterstorff was violently anti-apartheid, right? So this is not a monolithic diss on Calvin. It's more, you got to pick which camp you're going to be in, because <laughs> Calvin produces both. All right. Now, the winds of change. Uh, independence blows through. I'm going to move real fast here. Um, again, globally, right? King visits Ghana with Nkrumah uh, on Ghanaian independence. Uh, the famous story is that Richard Nixon, who's there as a delegate of the United States, looks to the person to the left of him and says, how does it feel to be free? And the man says, who's free? I'm from Alabama. There's the queen. <laughs> this is not that long ago. Um, in his sermon, reflecting on that visit, King says, after the visit in Ghana, I went to Westminster Abbey and I looked at all the splendor of the Church of England and it made me sick because I knew what built it. I knew that the British Empire was built on exploitation and that even if the church would not take a stand, God would take a stand. And he says, and on God grants, this is from 1957, King. This is early King. And God grants that we will get on board and start marching with God because we got orders now to break down the bondage and the walls of colonialism, exploitation, and imperialism. People don't get that message. This is the King of Belgium, uh, King Baudouin. Um, <laughs> favorite uh, anecdote about him, uh, somebody stole his sword at a rally in the Congo, <laughs> and he became very angry. But at Belgian independence, this, this is the king of Belgium. This is Leopold's grandson, right? He says, Leopold did a great thing here. This is 1960. The independence of Congo is the end result of the work that started with the exceptional personality of my grandfather, King Leopold II. He came here to liberate the Congo Basin from the horrible slave trade. He did not come here as a conqueror, but as a bringer of civilization. He killed 10 million people there, right? Patrice Lumumba, who is the first democratically elected leader of the Congo, speaks immediately after the king um, and says, no, <laughs> no, 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 that's not how it went. It was filled with tears, fire, and blood. Our wounds are too fresh and much too painful to be forgotten. We have seen our land seized in the name of ostensibly just laws, which gave recognition only to the right of might. We have experienced the atrocious suffering, being persecuted for political conviction and religious beliefs and exiled from our native land. Our lot was worse than death itself. That's an awkward room to be in. <laughs> One of those speeches after the other. The Belgian press said this proved that Lumumba was unfit to rule. Time magazine called it a venomous attack. The Western press hated it. Not long after this, uh, he's dead. So Patrice Lumumba was in power for about six months. I don't have time to go into the entire story, but immediately after he becomes prime minister, a group in the south in Katanga province, which is rich in minerals, secedes with the help of the Belgian government and becomes an independent state. Katanga at that time and the copper and cobalt in Katanga 
uh, made up for about a third of, of the entire wealth of the country. And they secede. Uh, Lumumba is assassinated. Um, a 1975 Senate intelligence report says the CIA played a role in assassinating Patrice Lumumba. That is true. Uh, but he was killed by Belgians and Congolese forces. It was the three of them working together, the Belgians, the United States, and uh, the Congolese separatists, who had been paid millions of dollars by the Belgians into private bank accounts in order to kill Lumumba. Uh, 1970 report uh, said that shortly before this, Dwight Eisenhower, in a meeting of the National Security Council, had said to the director of the CIA, what can we do to get Lumumba eliminated? Director of the CIA at that point was Alan Dulles, um, who, if you are from other parts of the world, oversaw the coup in Iran. It's the reason we have the government in Iran we have today. In Guatemala. The MK Ultra mind control experiments at the CIA. And the Bay of Pigs invasion. <laughs> So when you wonder to a man like Alan Dulles, can we eliminate Patrice Lumumba, he's the kind of guy that did that kind of stuff. So uh, the Congo goes into a deep conflict. This is right after independence. Belgium says you're independent now, right? Um, have fun, uh, hope it goes well. It doesn't go well, right? In Katanga though, there's a lot of white people. Um, most of the Belgian population lives in Katanga, so they're protected. They capture Lumumba, they kill Lumumba. Most of this fighting is done by European mercenaries, um, including this guy, uh, an Irish man named Mike Hoare, who died in South Africa uh, two years ago. He fought in this war in 1960s. During this same period, mysteriously again, the President of the United Nations is killed. <laughs> Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. Um, his plane goes down in 1961 over the Congo. Nobody knows who did it. Um, people have lots of suspicions. <laughs> um, France, Belgium, the United States, collaborating with Congolese people, it's hard to say. We do know because people admitted on TV that Patrice Lumumba was killed by Belgians and that Belgians then dug up his body, cut him up with bone saws, and dissolved it in acid because they didn't want his grave site to become a martyr, a place for uh, pilgrimages. This is all that remains of Patrice Lumumba. And that guy took it, direct quote, as a kind of trophy. He had that until this year. They returned that in June of 2022. All right, uh, let me see if I can play this Malcolm X video. I'm going to go right up to the time and we'll see how much I can do. Oh, we had it working. Can you play it? Now on the other foot, uh, only thing I can say is it's like chickens that always come back home to roost. You start at the beginning. You personally feel, though, that there's some shame or uh, involvement here or some guilt associated with the killing of other human beings. I think uh, Congolese have been massacred by white people in the Congo for years and years and years. And if uh, the shoe is now on the other foot, uh, only thing I can say is it's like chickens that always come back home to roots. Do you personally feel, though, that there's some shame or uh, involvement here or some guilt associated with the killing of other human beings? I think that the white people should be ashamed of the deplorable situation that has been existing in the Congo, which is not the fault of the Congolese, but which is the result of instigation by European powers who are fighting each other over the mineral wealth of the Congo. And now to make it appear that the Congolese themselves are criminals or brutes because they're reacting to these uh, uh, injustices that they've been victimized by is, is again ducking the question. Shambi uh, is the murderer of Lumumba, who was the rightful prime minister of the Congo. Shambi is the man whose forces uh, fought against the United Nations forces and against the United States. And despite this 
criminal past of Shambi, uh, now the United States, is backing Shambi, uh, who has hired uh, South African mercenaries, who are hired killers, to disrupt the uh, peaceful efforts of the freedom fighters from Stanleyville to uh, make the type of country there that they want. And it is this American support of Shambi, actually, that's at the root of the whole problem. All right. Let's stop that, go back to... So, Malcolm X, uh, as usual, uh, correct there. Thank you for that, by the way. So he's, you know, if you can't hear him, he says, look, <laughs> uh, the chickens have come home to roost. This is a U.S. problem. Uh, this is a problem of the colonial powers. Don't try to make this about me. Uh, can we get the PowerPoint back up and then come back to that one? Um, and he's right about that, he, you know, as he is about many things. All right. After that, then, the U.S. puts in a puppet government with the Belgians. Uh, and others, uh, Mobutu Sese Seko Kuku Mbendu, which uh, he sometimes translated as the all-powerful warrior who goes from conquest to conquest, leaving fire in his wake. <laughs> uh, Mobutu was a terrible dictator, and he was there for 30 years because the U.S. liked him because he was anti-communist. And Patrice Lumumba had been friendly with the Soviets, and we weren't having it. We wanted him out and we were willing to put a dictator in power for three decades as long as he wasn't a communist. That's him with the King of Belgium. There's the King of Belgium with Ronald Reagan. There's Mobutu with Nixon. There's Mobutu with Reagan. There's Mobutu with Bush. <laughs> There's Mobutu with Pat Robertson. <laughs> Pat Robertson had a diamond mine in the Congo. That's interesting. Um, there's Mobutu with uh, Juvenal Habermanyara uh, in Rwanda. And that's where this all comes down to, right? The Rwandan genocide. So I'm gonna to try to wrap down here uh, in a second. The United States did not wanna intervene in Rwanda because of what had happened in 1993 in Mogadishu, in Somalia, um, and so we didn't. The problem was that the Hutu uh, were gonna do it. <laughs> Again, um, this is the Bahutu Manifesto from 1957, right before independence. The ranks of the Hamites the Mohutu must suffer the domination of the Hamite and the European. It is a double colonialism, and we're going to kill them, right? So, uh, Habamanyara, his plane is shot down, again, <laughs> um, probably by Paul Kagame. <laughs> I'll just say that. Maybe he'll kill me. He's killed a lot of people um, who have said that. So, uh, but Paul Kagame comes in from Uganda. Uh, to stop the genocide of Tutsi people in Rwanda by Hutu power militias in the Intera Hamwe. Um, but Paul Kagame goes on to exact vengeance on those Hutu militias. Um, and the Hutu militias were allied with Mobutu. Mobutu was friends with Habamanyara, the Hutu leader of Rwanda who was killed in a plane crash. Uh, he, in fact, cremated him, buried him. So when Kagame, who trained at the U.S. Military College in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, <laughs> goes on his rampage out of Uganda into, Ken into uh, Rwanda uh, alongside his old fighting partner, Yoweri Musenevi, who's still the dictator of Uganda. There they are today. Um, it destabilizes the whole region. The United States, uh, under Bill Clinton, doesn't want to get involved because of Somalia. Punts, won't call it genocide, won't send people in, people die. He feels really bad about that, and he feels so bad about it that ever since the United States has more or less looked the other way, while Paul Kagame uh, exacts vengeance on Hutu militias who are now in the Eastern Congo. So, right, Hutu are in control in Rwanda. They have this idea that the Tutsi are Hamites. They come in to kill them. Kagame is a Tutsi, he invades from Uganda, he kicks the Hutu militias out into the Congo. They've been there ever since, all right? Every once in a while, they attack Rwanda. Every once in a while, Rwanda attacks them. Everything that's going on in the Eastern Congo involves uh, these countries, Burundi, Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo, because the colonial borders there are complete junk. <laughs> uh, they have no bearing on where the ethnic groups live. Right? Uh, and they've caused massive destabilization. So, Kagame, um, he's been in power since 1994. 
Uh, he keeps changing the Constitution. But because Kigali is clean and because he has a high percentage of women in Parliament, people let him do it. But from 1996 to 2003, there was what's called Africa's World War between all those different countries in the Congo, including also uh, Angola, Namibia, Sudan, um, et cetera, et cetera. That was negotiated to an end by Nelson Mandela and Laurent Kabila succeeded, uh, succeeded Mobutu. He was uh, assassinated. <laughs> Uh, his son, Joseph Kabila, became president. He's been president for most of your life, from 2001 to 2019. That's him in the background. He became president of the DRC when he was 29. Uh, he has rumored to spend most of his time drinking, playing video games, and riding his motorcycles. Uh, he's an immensely corrupt person uh, who has now left power, but only after extreme outside Western pressure. He was supposed to get out of office in 2016. Uh, he didn't resi uh, resign until 2019. He made all his money with China. If you want to know more about that, you can look up Congo Holdup, which is a sort of Panama Papers for the Congo. Uh, he created banks, he funneled money, he did that with Chinese, he also did that with Israeli businessmen, like Dan Gertler, who's a blood diamond warlord. <laughs> um, Dan Gertler has been involved in the Congo, he owns many of the big mines. The U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned Dan Gertler in 2017 under President Trump, saying um, that he had exploited vulnerable people, which he had. But then, on January 15, 2021, that's five days before President Biden was inaugurated, the, the Trump administration completely reversed course and said, go ahead, Dan, uh, go nuts in the Congo, have your money back, your bank accounts are unfrozen. They never explained why that happened. <laughs> because it was his administration that had sanctioned him, at least on paper with the president's support. Uh, but they took it away, um, because, partially because Dan Gertler hired Alan Dershowitz, one of President Trump's uh, personal lawyers, as his lobbyist. The Biden administration put that back in. Okay, final section. Real fast, I might go just a little over. So Chris Shore, right? Chris Shore uh, still has the backing of the Grand Rapids police. The police chief fired him, but the police chief doesn't control the police union. This is the police union. The police union believes he's completely innocent. So most of the cops that you see on the streets in Grand Rapids believe that Christopher Scherr did nothing wrong and are posting about it a lot on Facebook. <laughs> that he is a Christian, that he went on missionary trips to Kenya. They posted this. This is uh, to humanize him, right? How can you look at this photo and see anything wrong? They've been saying that everything that's going on in Grand Rapids is a result of attacks on them. This is what happens when you defund the police indirectly, whatever that means, because they actually have more money than they do last year. <laughs> so it's a, it's a stretch. Uh, they, they talk a lot about law and order <laughs> and against the idea that people commit crimes because of underprivileged backgrounds. They think that's all BS. Quoting Gerald Ford, this Gerald Ford? <laughs> That's the Lowell showboat, the Robert E. Lee. That's a man in blackface in 1965. So Chris Sure got married in Kenya with none of his family there. I don't know how many of those people he could actually even talk to. He goes to a reformed church in Byron Center. The people that he went on the mission trip with still preach at that church a lot. They have lots of things to say. So, one of my former colleagues at Calvin said, we need to stop thinking about short-term missions as a service platform and instead as a learning platform. Why is this country so poor? What problems are people facing? What has our country done to contribute? She's in Honduras, she knows. Again, Calvin produces both these schools of thought. The mission that he went to was there, right across the border in Kenya. That's where Patrick Leoya's family was from. How can you go there and not see this man? 
What's going on? Patrick Leoya's family left there in 2003 at the end of the big war that I just mentioned after his mother was raped by militiamen. They lived in a refugee camp in Malawi from the time that Patrick was seven years old. This is that refugee camp, Zaleka. It was built to house 10,000 people. It has 50,000 people in it. He came here, he worked at a turkey plant until he was stabbed by a coworker. He was unemployed, he had a drinking problem. He's trying to get his life together. Now, uh, before I close with a video, um, I talked to Abdul Saleh Havagamana, right? He says the single thing, I said, Abdul, what do you want Calvin's students to know? Because he's a, Rwanda, or a, a Congolese refugee who came to Calvin as a student, went to high school at the Potter's House. He said, they need to know that their cell phones and computers, every single one of them, have minerals from the Congo, and that everyone is involved in this. That all the conflict in the Congo goes back to minerals and warlords, and none of us are innocent from that. And that's true. That's why they're fighting in there, for coltan and tin and tantalum and tungsten and gold. He said, I am sorry, he sent me a very long message and he said, I'm sorry, I'm so passionate about this. And I said, Abdul, don't, don't ever apologize for anything. Uh, so that's what he wants you to know. Um, so there, Christianity, greed, colonialism, capitalism. What's going on with the death of Patrick Leoya and what does justice for him actually mean, right? It's not just criminal justice. All right, this is where I was gonna seamlessly transition to the video which is a song, so if you can maybe start getting that ready. Okay, this is a song written by two of his best friends who go to church right up the street at COS. Um, one of them is the son of a former student of mine. Can you full screen it? And then I'm done, this is like three minutes, so I'm just hanging around.
Patrick Lioya, we love you. All right, that's it. You guys can head out. <laughs> if you want to stay, I can take questions, bud.